Hi friends, Benjamin is with you, and today I will tell you another chilling story. On September 14th, 2016, a Wednesday, a fire broke out early in the morning at Acorn Woods near Grapevine Lake, Texas, United States. Firefighters successfully extinguished the blaze and, during their investigation, came across what seemed to be a melted child's paddling pool containing a charred body. The gender of the individual could not be determined at that point. Subsequent fingerprint analysis revealed the deceased person to be Jackie Vandegriff, a 24-year-old licensed esthetician studying nutrition at Texas Women's University in Denton. Since she had not been reported missing, law enforcement inferred that she likely met her demise shortly after her last known sighting. It was established that Jackie was last seen on the night of September 13th, just one night prior to the discovery of her charred body. On that evening, she had visited two bars in Denton, namely Fry Street Public House and Shots and Crafts. In addition to being set ablaze, Jackie had suffered gruesome mutilation. She had been dismembered. The urgency to apprehend the perpetrator of such brutality was paramount. Following numerous tips regarding a man observed near the fire, law enforcement obtained footage of Jackie on the night of September 13th. The footage captured her interacting with a man. Further investigation revealed that this man had given his business card to one of the women present at the bar that night, claiming to be a fitness instructor and offering his services as a personal trainer. His name was identified as Charles Bryant. Police determined that Jackie and Charles had only just met on the night of September 13th during a chance encounter. Initially, Jackie had gone to the bar with the intention of exploring job opportunities and had originally planned to meet someone from Tinder that night, but she changed her plans. While at the bar, she engaged in conversation with the bartender and Charles, a 31-year-old individual. Subsequently, they joined a group of women and spent time together. According to Jackie's friends, she was sociable and frequently interacted with various people she met during a night out. Charles had been at Fry Street Public House since approximately 7 p.m. that evening. While he had been with friends earlier, he was alone at the bar when Jackie arrived around 8 p.m. She inquired about job opportunities from the bartender and lingered for a while conversing with both the bartender and Charles. The footage obtained by the police from inside the bar suggested that Jackie was enjoying herself. Remarkably, just 45 minutes after her arrival, she tweeted, I'm glad I decided to get off Tinder and walk to a bar. The trio, Jackie, the bartender, and Charles, departed the initial bar at 9 p.m. and headed to another nearby establishment. It was at this subsequent bar that they encountered a group of women, spending approximately 45 minutes there. As inclement weather marked by heavy rain set in, the patrons began making their way home. Jackie then left the bar with Charles and then stopped at the store. This was Jackie's last appearance alive. Unbeknownst to Jackie on that fateful night, Charles Bryant harbored a troubling past. In the weeks leading up to their meeting, Charles had faced arrest three times. His sole reason for being in the Denton area was Caitlin Mathis, his ex-girlfriend. Despite residing 20 miles away in Hazlitt, Charles's ex, Caitlin, had recently relocated to Denton to attend the University of North Texas and resided on campus. Caitlin had taken legal action by filing a restraining order against him. Having characterized their relationship as toxic due to Charles's manipulative behavior and narcissism, Caitlin ended the tumultuous connection in August 2016, just a few months before the tragic events unfolded. Even after Caitlin terminated their relationship and relocated to Denton, Charles persisted in disrupting her life. Police encountered him on the campus, resulting in a ban. Unyielding, he continued attempting to communicate with Caitlin. On August 31st, he appeared at the restaurant where she worked. Despite the campus ban, he showed up at Caitlin's door on September 6th. Fearing for her safety, Caitlin refrained from answering and promptly contacted the police. Charles left flowers and a letter at her doorstep, prompting law enforcement to apprehend him for trespassing. Shortly after being arrested, Charles posted bond, securing his release. 
Almost immediately, he reached out to Caitlin through a newly created email address, stating, Here I am heartbroken and with a criminal record for bringing the girl I love flowers. In response to these alarming developments, Caitlin obtained an emergency protective order to safeguard herself from further harassment and potential harm. Despite facing prior arrests for stalking, Charles persisted in attempting to contact Caitlin. Following another arrest for stalking, he was released on bond two days later. On the 13th of September, a week after his latest release, Charles returned to Denton, specifically visiting Fry Street Public House, a location frequented by Caitlin. Although law enforcement was aware of the troubled history between Charles and Caitlin, there was insufficient evidence to link him to Jackie's murder. While it was established that he was with Jackie on the night of her death, additional evidence was needed. The opportunity to question him arose shortly after the discovery of Jackie's body, when Charles once again violated the restraining order by trying to contact Caitlin. He was brought in for questioning on the 18th of September 2016 regarding Jackie's death. By this point, the police had gathered surveillance footage, interviewed individuals present at the bars, and tracked Charles's movements. Their investigation revealed that in the early morning hours of September 14th at 4.41 a.m., Charles had visited Walmart and purchased a shovel. Additionally, a children's paddling pool was found to be missing from his backyard, adding a concerning element to the unfolding investigation. When the police questioned Charles, he initially claimed to have only seen Jackie at the bar. However, as the detective presented a comprehensive and chronological overview of the evidence, it became evident that Charles was aware he couldn't deny being with Jackie that night. Eventually, he confessed that Jackie died accidentally while they were together but during a consensual yet unconventional sexual encounter. Charles recounted to the detective that after leaving the bar together, Jackie requested him to use a zip tie to choke her in his car. Despite having a zip tie in his vehicle, the police doubted his account, leading to charges of murder and tampering with or fabricating physical evidence against him. The prosecution asserted that Charles and Jackie met that night, went to a second bar, and returned to his house. During the trial, the jury learned from the medical examiner that tests on Jackie's remains revealed no signs of sexual assault. The prosecution argued that Jackie's death wasn't the result of a sexual encounter, but rather a brutal assault involving strangulation with a zip tie, followed by dismemberment with a knife and subsequent incineration. According to the prosecution's narrative presented to the jury, the evidence would establish that both Charles and Jackie met on the 13th of September at a bar, leaving together with no one else accompanying them in his car. The prosecution emphasized that various pieces of evidence, including items discovered and DNA analysis, would confirm Jackie's presence inside Charles's residence. The jury was shown surveillance footage from the bars, and testimonies from bar patrons and employees supported the assertion that Charles and Jackie were together. The footage displayed them leaving the bar at 9.46 p.m., getting into Charles's car, and remaining in the car park for an additional 30 minutes before departing. Subsequent surveillance footage from a Denton gas station exhibited Jackie inside Charles's car at 10.30 p.m., marking the last confirmed sighting of her alive. Furthermore, Jackie's phone activity indicated its connection to a cell tower in Hazlitt, Texas, around 1.30 a.m. on the 14th of September, an area encompassing Charles's residence. The jury was informed that Jackie had a Texas Woman's University bag at the bar and a matching TWU bag was discovered at Charles's house. Additionally, a zip tie with hair on it was found in the trash can outside his residence. Notably, in Charles's backyard, there was a blue children's paddling pool resembling the one found burned. Next to the pool, a circular barren spot suggested the presence of another pool. Inside Charles's residence, the police discovered a knife which they believed was used in the stabbing and dismemberment of Jackie, and a stun gun was found in his car. Both items were officially entered as evidence. During the court proceedings, the medical examiner stated that Jackie's cause of death was homicidal violence. 
It was highlighted that there was no presence of soot in her airways, indicating that she was deceased before her body was set on fire. The medical examiner further testified that Jackie had fractures in her hyoid bone, a result of force applied to the upper neck. Providing additional insight, a forensic anthropologist informed the court that the hyoid bone is a U-shaped bone located deep in the throat, serving as an anchor for the tongue. Jackie exhibited a broken hyoid bone and fractured ribs, as testified by the forensic anthropologist. The injuries were determined to be paramortem, occurring around the time of death, and were not associated with dismemberment. The anthropologist indicated that the hyoid bone injury was consistent with strangulation, requiring direct pressure typically resulting from manual strangulation or ligature use. However, due to the burning of Jackie's soft tissue during the fire, it couldn't be definitively established whether the fracture was caused manually or by a ligature. The expert agreed that a zip tie could potentially cause such an injury. Additionally, Jackie suffered a head injury from blunt force trauma, deemed unlikely to be post-mortem due to the significant hemorrhaging. Stab wounds on her body appeared unrelated to the dismemberment process, and the state's expert asserted that these wounds seemed inflicted while Jackie was still alive. The expert explained, Well, the fact that there was some bleeding around those stab wounds suggests that she was alive at the time they were received, which means that those could have bled. The jury learned that certain injuries on Jackie's body were inflicted after her death, including the opening of her chest and removal of her heart, along with multiple fractures of her ribs. A DNA profile extracted from the zip tie, stun gun, and knife made it almost statistically impossible that the sample came from someone other than Jackie. The DNA analyst testified that DNA was found on the stun gun recovered from his car and that Jackie could not be excluded as the major contributor. The defense presented its argument, contending that there was no evidence supporting the notion that Jackie's death resulted from violent actions on Charles's part. Instead, they asserted that Jackie's demise occurred during what they described as consensual sexual act. According to the defense, Charles, in a state of panic, subsequently attempted to dispose of Jackie's body. During the trial, defense witnesses discussed the concept of erotica asphyxiation, suggesting that individuals engaging in such activities do so to derive pleasure from depriving their brains of oxygen. In the defense's case, it was argued that a zip tie was employed around Jackie's throat as part of a consensual sexual act, resulting in her death. According to their account, Jackie's body became limp, causing Charles to freak out. The defense contended that the subsequent dismemberment and setting the body on fire were impulsive and chaotic actions driven by panic and intoxication. In her closing arguments, Charles's attorney, Joetta Keene, acknowledged that Charles made a terrible mistake, stating, He's guilty of making a horrible mistake when something went wrong. There was no motive for a good-looking guy to kill that good-looking girl. Contrarily, the prosecution, in their closing statements, challenged the defense's narrative, asserting that there was no evidence supporting the claim that Charles and Jackie engaged in sexual activity. They dismissed the defense's argument that Charles panicked as nonsensical, emphasizing the severity of his actions. The defense says he freaked out, but their own experts said it was homicidal violence. Why cut out the heart? What does it have to do with disposing of a body? He cut her heart out. I want that image to sink in. The jury had to decide whether they believed that Jackie was murdered and it was a deliberate act or if she died as a result of a consensual sexual act. They found Charles guilty of murder and tampering with evidence. He was sentenced to life in prison for the murder conviction and 20 years confinement for tampering. The sentences will be served concurrently. Before the trial, there was a lot of discussion as to what the possible motive could be. Prosecutors tend to worry if there is no clear motive as jurors like to hear a full story and explanation of what happened. They have to be certain of their verdict before they convict, and in many cases, a motive adds huge weight to the prosecution's case. In this case, the prosecution had no motive. But does that matter? When the evidence is clear, do we need a motive? In cases like this, the motive is usually a sexual one, but the prosecution argued there was no evidence any sexual activity took place. 
But we don't need to know what went through the mind of Charles Bryant that night. He wanted to do it, and he did. Jackie's parents have partnered with Texas Woman's University to offer an endowment in Jackie's memory. What do you think about this story? Share your opinions in the comments. Thanks for watching and for being with us. Take care of yourself and your loved ones.